This is lecture 24, Patent Remedies, Part 2. The agenda for the lecture is relatively straightforward. We're going to spend the bulk of the lecture discussing the concept of damages in the patent law, and then a little bit at the end about other aspects of damages that, that are relevant and important, which are willful infringement issues and whether or not attorney's fees can be awarded in certain circumstances. This is class 23, Patent Remedies 2, Damages. Today's agenda is to talk about damages and then go over briefly willful infringement and attorney's fees. So patent damages is, uh, as I've mentioned I think a few times in the course, a, a difficult and uh, complicated topic. Um, and in fact, in terms of the, the way that it works in litigation, is that patent damages uh, ends up almost always being, in a sense, a separate trial. Uh, what most district court judges do, although it varies some, uh, is have a, a full trial on uh, infringement and validity, uh, determining whether there's liability for uh, patent infringement, whether that exists. And if it does, then have a separate uh, hearing, um, usually with the same jury, but not always, uh, sometimes the judge does damages when the jury does infringement, but in any event, a separate proceeding that deals specifically with the issues surrounding uh, damages. And I think you'll understand why after we go through this a little bit and indeed um, work through the class exercise. So patent damages is, is established by 35 U.S.C. Section 284. Uh, and, and 284 basically says, uh, upon finding for the claimant, the court shall award the claimant damages adequate to compensate for the infringement, right? And so that's the key there, adequate to compensate. That's the standard for how much damages are supposed to be awarded. But in no less, in no event less than a reasonable royalty for the use made of the invention by the infringer, together with any interest and costs. When the damages are not found by the jury, the court shall assess them. In either event, the court may increase the damages up to three times the amount found or assessed. Increased damages shall not apply provisional rights. So that's a different issue, and the court may receive expert testimony, right? So the, the key highlights here, right? So at the end of the day, you need to, to have damages that are adequate to compensate uh, for infringement. What that basically means is that the purpose of damages uh, in the patent context is to put the patentee in the position that she would have been in absent uh, the infringement by uh, the infringer. Okay, So that's the standard. And you'll note that what the court says here is that in, in no event can you award less than a reasonable royalty. So we'll talk about what that means uh, in a moment. But that sets, in a sense, a floor for how much money can be awarded. You cannot award less than a reasonable royalty for the use of the patented invention. And then the other highlighted part is what we'll talk about right at the end of, of class here, which is the issue of willful infringement and, and uh, treble damages, right? So uh, obviously tripling damages uh, is an extremely powerful weapon uh, and matters a lot in many cases. Uh, and so willful infringement, which is what, what triggers a, typically a finding of uh, uh, treble damages, um, is, is a thing that's <laughs> going to be a attempted to be avoided by any patent, uh, potential patent in, infringer. Um, and as you'll see, the court has, the Federal Circuit has uh, changed over the last decade or so some of the standards for willful infringement, uh, made it a little harder to get treble damages uh, because you can imagine how the damages tend to add up quite quickly. Uh, and again, the court may receive expert testimony, and in fact, as a practical matter, courts almost always will receive tech, uh, expert testimony. Um, a lot of patent damages is very heavy on e economics um, for reasons that we'll see in a moment. So here's the basic overview, right? The preferred method, preferred from the sense of uh, the patentee and and frankly, preferred in the sense that that's what the uh, statute would mandate uh, here, is that you get uh, a calculation uh, of damages based on lost profits, right? Uh, and why? Well, because that comes the closest, uh, that, that method comes the closest to putting the patentee in the position that she would have been in absent infringement. 
right? Lost profits. So saying you're what we are basically saying when we're talking about lost profits is let's think about what profits the patentee would have made had infringement not occurred, and we will award those to the patentee. Right? So really trying the best we can to put the patentee in the position that she would have been in absent infringement. Right? However, lost profits cannot always be shown. Variety of reasons, and we'll talk about those, uh, but, but lost profits can be difficult to show. And if you can't show lost profits, it doesn't mean that you don't get any money. Right? In many sort of civil litigation contexts, if you can't show your actual damages, if you can't show precisely how much money um, you would have uh, that, that you lost as the result of the harm done to you, you don't get any money. But not in the patent context. In the patent context, at the minimum, you get a reasonable royalty. Right? So meaning uh, that there's going to be some payment, and that payment will be based on a royalty basis. Uh, for whatever um, the the infringer sold, did, provided services for, etc. Right. So there are sort of two ways to calculate damages. Two major ways to calculate damages: lost profits and reasonable royalty. Lost profits is preferred in the sense that it it is likely to uh, be the closest to what the statute describes as adequate to compensate. And it also obviously is preferred almost all the time by the patentee uh, because it's going to give, uh, in general, more money. Now, why would lost profits give more money than a reasonable royalty? Well, think about it this way. If, if I am um, making widgets and selling widgets myself, I get all the profits. Right? Every widget, if I sell the widgets for $10 and they cost me $5 to make, I get $5. Now, if I'm not actually the one selling the widgets, right? If I'm hire some other company, uh, for example, to make the widgets for me and and distribute them, then that five dollar profit on the widgets is going to have to be shared between myself and this other company. And so, for that reason, I make less profits on that, right? So uh, that the royalty payments are going to um, because there's going to be profits just in the manufacturing and distribution services provided by the infringer, right? Uh, and the royalty payments are going to be lower, inevitably, than the lost profits, okay? Now, note that in many cases in the patent context, you just won't be able to get lost profits uh, because uh, many patentees don't manufacture themselves, right? They may uh, not be the, the, their own, they may in fact only license their patents. And in that case, there's no lost profits to show. The only thing you can show is the reasonable royalty rate, and then, then you argue about that. And we'll see a case where that, that comes into play, right? But again, I, the big takeaway here, and the thing I want you to be real clear about is that there are two ways to calculate. One is lost profits, the other is reasonable royalty. All right, let's, let's go through lost profits. The main case here is the Wright Height versus Kelly case, which is an en banc uh, Federal Circuit case. So the basic idea of lost profits is fairly simple. The way that you try and figure out what lost profits means is you add up the amount of profits that the patentee would have made uh, given the, um, uh, in the absence of infringement and you award that amount of money from, from the inf infringer, okay? And so the main issue and the, and the difficult issue here uh, in, in the lost profits context is to, to consider what products do you include in the calculation of lost profits. And the Wright Height versus Kelly case is about that issue. This is, the technology here is dock levelers for uh, semi-trucks. A semi-truck, for example, will um, back into a loading dock and these devices will be used um, to essentially lock the truck uh, up against the loading dock so that you can roll um, the cargo on and off, right? And so, um, right height, uh, the, the patentee here sells um, uh, multiple kinds of uh, uh, products here. Right, so the first two products, the MDL fifty five, right, uh, and the ADL one hundred, right, are 
are products that are, and the MDL-55 is a, is a patented product. It was covered by the patent, right? Meaning it, it uh, operated uh, under the patent that was infringed, right? But it was not competitive uh, with the infringing product, right? So there wasn't a direct competition. Uh, with the infringing product, right? For for reasons that aren't entirely clear to me, the way that this market worked was that the uh, the infringing product uh, actually competed with a different um, uh, right height uh, product, the ADL 100, right? But the MDL 55, because it's a patented product and the product itself is is uh, was pat was covered by a patent and that patent was infringed in the litigation. This is sort of the easiest case, right? Clearly, any profits for lost sales of MDs, MDL 55s, it could be shown, are attributable to the damages calculation, right? So you basically say, I, I sold 100 MDL 55s, but instead of that, uh, uh, I would have sold 100. Instead, I only sold 50. Therefore, the profits on that extra 50 that I lost um, are lost profits, and I get awarded that in damages. Right, so that's the sort of the the basic uh, lost profits calculation. Try and figure out how many, uh, in this case, MDL 55s they would have sold, and and then uh, add up the profits from those lost sales, and that's the lost profits. Now the ADL 100 is a is a more difficult question, right? And and the issue here is that in the ADL 100. Uh, the these were covered by a patent, but that the patent that covered the ADL 100 was not the patent that was infringed in this litigation, right? So, and in, in essentially, the ADL 100 was not a patented product for the purposes of this litigation, right? Nonetheless, it competed. This product competed directly with the product that was found to infringe. Right, and so what Wright Height says is, well, I should get lost sales, all I lost profits from the ADL 100s because, in the absence of infringement, uh, those sales would have gone to me. They would have come to ADL 100 because that's that my competitive product, right? And that's um, and for that reason, the court agrees and says, even though. The ADL 100 was not actually covered by the patent in issue. It is nonetheless suitable to be included in the lost profits analysis because in the absence of the infringement, it was foreseeable that more ADL 100s would have been sold. And as long as Wright Height can prove um, to a jury uh, that uh, give enough evidence of how many of the ADL 100s can be, were sold, then whatever it can prove uh, is going to be uh, included in the lost profits analysis. Now, there's a third product at issue here, which are the dock levelers, right? And the dock levelers are simply a, basically they appear to be sort of ramps that, that connect the, the trucks with the loading docks. And they are not patented, right? These are apparently older technology, uh, not uh, patented widely used. Um, what they are, however, is a complementary good. Meaning, if you order an MDL 55 or an ADL 100, or actually, I think I think these things come in pairs. So, if you order a pair of these, you almost always also order the dock levelers as well. Um, uh, but they aren't patented, not covered by any of the patents in issue here, uh, and they're just a complementary good. Here, the court says no; those cannot be included. Even though they're complementary goods, right? They are too far. It was not foreseeable, right? It was not the proximate cause of the um, uh, infringement that any lost sales of the dock levelers happened. Okay, uh, and so that's uh, right. Height is an important case because it gives you the parameters of what can be included in the analysis of. Uh, the, the lost profits, right? And that is you can include things even when they aren't patented as long as in the absence of the infringement you can prove the sales would have been lost. The important thing here to understand 
where this line is between what can be included in the lost profits analysis and what can't be, I think is shown on the discussion in Wright Height, page 793, about halfway down. Right? What, what the, the argument here was, is it a simple but-for test? Right? Meaning, can you look at every single possible consequence of the infringement and say, hey, that's lost. That's a lost sale. Right. I mean, so for example, let's say you know that that right height also, as a part of um, these um, uh, sales of of some of these products, you know, they they offered other services such as repair services or um, uh, you know a ongoing warranty or or something like that. Can can right height say, well, you know, we would have but for the infringement, sold some additional amount of these additional services, even though they have nothing to do with the patent and indeed are not covered by any patent at all, they are still in a, in a but for sense, but for the infringement, we would have been able to um, uh, sell these things. Right? Uh, and so that's uh, a, the, the argument. What the court says in right height is that that's, it's not simply but for. Right? It has to be, in the, I think the best way of describing it is a proximate cause. Right? That, that really the infringement has to be you know, almost in a tort sense, the proximate cause of the lost sales. And that, that is the reason that the ADL 100s can be included, whereas the dock levelers cannot. Because right? although it's almost certain that but for the infringement, right height would have sold additional dock levelers, Right? It was not the infringement, it's not close enough, the proximate cause, the infringement was not the proximate cause of the lost sales of the dock levelers in the sense that it was you know, a, a natural or, or inevitable consequence. Right? Whereas the ADL 100s, even though they're not a patented product, because they competed directly, because they are a directly competitive product, then clearly any sales uh, that you know, it, it, the the fact that the infringer was selling impacted the sales of the ADL 100 in a very direct sense, right? So that's what the court is getting at there at page 793, where they say um, judicial limitations on damages, either for certain classes of plaintiffs or certain types of injuries, have imposed in terms of proximate cause or foreseeability. Such labels have been judicial tools used to limit legal responsibility for the consequences that are too remote to justify compensation. The general principles expressed in the common law tell us the question of legal compensability is one to be determined on the facts of each case upon mixed considerations of logic, common sense, justice, policy, and precedent. Right? Um, so what they say, and we believe that under Section 284, the balance between full compensation, which is the meaning that the Supreme Court has attributed to the statute, and the reasonable limits of liability encompassed by general principles of law can best be viewed in terms of reasonable objective foreseeability. If a particular injury was or should have been reasonably foreseeable by an infringing competitor in the relevant market, broadly defined, that injury is compensable absent a persuasive reason to the contrary. Here, Wright Heights lost sales of the ADL 100, a product that directly competed with the infringing product were reasonably foreseeable. Being responsible, we agree with that conclusion. Being responsible for lost sales of a competitive product is surely foreseeable. Such losses constitute the full compensation set forth for Congress. So that's the line that you that that right height draws is this reasonable objective foreseeability. Okay, and obviously that's open to some interpretation, and there's usually in many cases a fair amount of litigation about what constitutes foreseeable consequences of, of infringement. Uh, and it's not the same. And, and again, you can see from the court's language, this is a, almost a case-by-case -case basis. So how do you determine lost profits? Well, you have to show uh, as part of your evidentiary showing, and again, remember that the patentee uh, bears the burden of proof here. Um, so what, whoever's asking for the damages, the patentee uh, has to show uh, demand for the patented good, the absence of any acceptable non-infringing substitutes, the ability to capture the demand, right? So if I'm claiming that I'm going to sell 100 widgets and the 100 more widgets in the absence of infringement, I have to show that there was demand that people would have actually bought 100 more of my widgets. 
I have to show that there w- that people would not have overwhelmingly moved to some other product if the infringing product wasn't on the market, right? So I have to show that there weren't other competitive products that people would have moved to. And, and I have to show that I had the capacity, either manufacturing capacity, distributional capacity, sales capacity, whatever we mean by capacity. I have to have the ability to actually capture the demand. And then finally, I have to show the marginal profits per sale. So if I'm going to sell 100 widgets, I need to show that I would make you know, $10 a widget or whatever the, the number is. So those are the, the elements that I have to show and prove in order to make to win my case. Right? One of the interesting issues that arises fairly often in damages calculations is the issue of non-infringing substitutes, right? Uh, and and the Grain Processing Corp uh, case from the Federal Circuit in 1999 asked this question, right? Which is, can a product not on the market be a non-infringing substitute? And the answer to that is 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 yes, uh, because even if a you know the idea of a non-infringing substitute is um, so if I have a patent on my widgets, and and uh, therefore I have pricing power, right? I can charge, in theory, whatever amount I want uh, for my widgets. But the reality is I can't actually charge whatever amount I want for the widgets because people will simply move to something that, although maybe not as good as my patented product, is nonetheless almost as good, right? Or close enough and cheaper, right? That's a non-infringing substitute, right? People will find a substitute to purchase if I price too high. So my pricing is controlled. My ability to um, set prices and indeed how much I'm going to sell is controlled by the non-infringing substitutes. In the grain processing case, um, the issue there was that the non-infringing substitute that the defendant wanted to point to to say that, well, they would not have captured the entire market was not actually on the market at the time, right? It had been on the market before. It was a well-known technolo- or well-known uh, composition, but had not been used for some time. And the court in, in uh, grain processing says that, that indeed a non-infringing substitute can nonetheless uh, be one that is not yet on the market because presumably the way that markets work is, is if I price too high or if there's sufficient amount of demand given the um, uh, the demand curve that uh, those non-infringing products will be in fact remanufactured, put on the market uh, and will be available as substitutes uh, and, and therefore either keep my sales down or keep my pricing power down. Right? Uh, and so that's why uh, a non-infringing substitute can, it doesn't matter whether it's on the market or not, the, the issue is, is, it, is it how much, how close of a substitute is it? How much is it going to change my ability to price? Uh, and uh, and capture demand and uh, and is it is it readily available? Another issue uh, that comes up in lost profits is the issue of price erosion, right? So let's consider the hypothetical here, right? So the the patentee is charging ten dollars per unit and sells one hundred units. The infringer is charging. Um, uh, Ten dollars per unit and sells a hundred units. So, w- what revenues can the patentee claim as being lost? Right? Is it the thousand dollars? Now, let's set aside profits here. Let's just talk about what revenues can we claim as loss. Is it the thousand dollars that ten ten dollars times a hundred uh, that the infringer was selling? Can we attribute all of those uh, to the patentee? Right? Um, would it be more? Would it be less? Well, it's complicated. It's not. It's clearly not simply going to be the thousand dollars, right? On the one hand, it could be it could be significantly less than the thousand dollars. How might that happen? Well, if there were non-infringing substitutes, for example, right? It might be that some of those hundred units that the infringer sold would have actually been captured by some third party, a non-infringing substitute, right? Um, but all right. So even let's say that's not the case. It's still not simply the thousand dollars because, in the absence of the infringer, one would expect the patentee to be able to price higher than ten dollars per unit, right? So let's say if the infringer wasn't on the market, right, the patentee would then 
probably optimally priced higher, right? They would charge something closer to the monopoly price. Um, so let's call it $14 per unit. And then they would not sell 200 units at $14. They'd sell something less, but it would be a higher amount of revenue than the, than the additional $1,000, right? So it, what, it, what I'm trying to get at here is that because of issues of price erosion, because of issues of non-infringing substitutes, the modern trend in patent damages is that, is that you're going to have to do a very careful market reconstruction for lost profits analysis. And really, it requires um, uh, a careful and, and thorough thinking through of what would have happened but for the infringement. Right? How would have uh, how would the market look? Um, how how many items would be sold? What would the pricing look like? Would there be complementary products that were uh, objectively foreseeable uh, that would have been sold as well? All of these go into this issue of of the lost profits uh, analysis and makes these uh, analyses really complicated. Very interesting, but really complicated. A quick issue, a quick point on the entire market value rule. This is a pretty controversial rule in damages. Um, uh, it, it applies both in the lost profits context and in the reasonable royalty context. Uh, allows for recovery of lost profits on the entire product, even when patented and unpatented components are sold together. Right. So think about you know a smartphone, for example. A smartphone has thousands of individual features. Um, let's say there's an infringement uh, found for uh, one major feature, right? Um, the entire market value rule would say that you get the profits on the entire smartphone, right? Rather than trying to attribute out uh, what profit component of the smartphone is, um, it can, be, can be given directly to the patented uh, product. So that um, uh, means that's, of course, a very good rule for the patentee, right? Because it allows for um, a much larger base of lost profits analysis. It's also much simpler to, to evaluate. And part of the reason that the courts have used this rule is that trying to figure out, for example, in the smartphone context, let's say, you know, thinking about one of Apple's patents on the on the momentum scrolling for the iPhone, where you you slide your finger and the scrolling continues even after you lift your finger, um, uh, is that you know what what is the amount of of the profits on each iPhone that is attributable to that feature? Well, that's a very very difficult question, and frankly, probably not one that's really answerable. You could, in theory, um, ask consumers what they were. Uh, you know what types of the features they were looking for, but really at the end of the day, it's probably not an answerable question. And so the the Federal Circuit has adopted in many cases this entire market value rule, which would say, well, if you've infringed, then the entire profits of the iPhone uh, are what we would call lost profits, right? Uh, and so it makes sense in the sense that it does fully compensate. And the argument is that you know. If you include an important feature, if you include a feature uh, that's patented, you know you would not have sold the same product. The product would be different, right? The iPhone would not be the iPhone without that particular product, and therefore it's it makes sense to offer uh, the entire profits, the entire market value, the, uh, as as the lost profits. On the other hand, it seems unquestionable that this is going to over award uh, the amount of damages for um, uh, lost sales because uh, it's very clear that any you know in, in these types of products where there are many features not all of them patented uh, then uh, it's no no particular feature is likely to be driving sales and therefore in some sense it's not correct to say that that the patent uh, had lost uh, that the patent itself um, uh, the infringement of that patent caused this amount of lost profits, right? Um, uh, so, you know, if I patent a small component of a, a spell checking algorithm, the word processing software, can I leave lost profits on, on sales of the word processing software? What about entire office suites, right? Um, now, under the entire market value rule, then probably I could. I could get the entire market value of each of those sales. Um, that's not always the case. Courts are certainly uh, able to 
um, uh, try and parse out what the profits are, but that's that's different, uh, difficult to do, and and uh, the entire market value rule um, generally says that as long as it's a significant component, uh, then you uh, attribute the entire market value to um, uh, to the infringement. It's come under obviously some fire because maybe it overcompensates. It might lead to more litigation than. Then is efficient. Uh, it might overvalue the contribution of certain types of inventions, particularly in the um, context of high technology, where many of the products, software and hardware products, uh, involve combinations of many dozens or even hundreds, perhaps thousands of inventions into one particular um, product, uh, which means that those products in particular are very uh, vulnerable to um, this entire market value rule analysis. On the other hand, those products in particular, it's very important that all of these features are integrated and work together, and so you can make also make a pretty good argument uh, that in the absence of uh, any particular feature, the whole thing might not work very well, and so therefore maybe the entire market value uh, rule is the right rule in this context. But that's that's an ongoing debate, um, and we'll see uh, uh, what happens in the future uh, with the court uh, in that regard. So let's move on and talk about reasonable royalty here. So the reasonable royalty is basically the idea that if I can't show lost profits, uh, then I'm going to get a royalty rate. What do we mean by a royalty rate? Well, a royalty rate is for each widget that I sell, I owe the patentee um, X amount of money. It, that might be uh, expressed in terms of dollars. For each widget I sell, I owe the patentee $2, for example. Uh, it might be expressed in terms of percentages, uh, which could be uh, in I O uh, the patentee seven percent of my total sales uh, of of widgets. Um, sometimes these are uh, split between two kinds of um, uh, royalties: a lump sum royalty where I pay up front. Right, I, I say I'm going to give you. A thousand dollars, and then I get to make as many widgets as I want uh, under the patent uh, without fear of infringement, um, uh, something like that, uh, or a running royalty rate where we don't set a number, uh, and I just say, all right, at the end of each quarter or end of each year, I'll give you, you know, the percentage or the number um, uh, based on the sales that I actually made. So. The the tricky part, obviously, in in figuring out reasonable royalty is what's the numbers, right? How do you come up with this? Well, so there are 15 factors that the courts use. These are known as the Georgia Pacific factors um, that concern the types of information that the court should consider when evaluating a reasonable royalty analysis. Uh, so let's look at these briefly. The royalties received uh, for licensing the patent, proving or tending to prove an established royalty the rates paid by the licensee for the use of other similar patents. The nature, so one and two are pretty important, right? So if, if indeed, uh, as the patentee, I have already licensed this particular patent to others, then uh, whatever that royalty rate was is going to be very, very important evidence uh, for how much would a reasonable royalty be. Uh, similarly, if the licensee, meaning the infringer, uh, has uh, licensed similar types of patents, then whatever rate they were paying for those would also be very relevant to how much a reasonable royalty rate would be. And from there, the, the Georgia Pacific factors get broader, right? Uh, the, the type of the license, um, the, the policy of maintaining the patent monopoly, the commercial relationship between the patentee uh, and the licensees, the effect of selling um, uh, these for the sales of other Georgia Pacific products, the duration of the patent, the term of the license, the profitability of the product, the utility advantages over any old modes or devices, the nature of the patent and invention, its character, the extent to which the infringer used the invention, the portion of the profit, the portion of the realizable profit uh, that should be credited to the invention, the opinion testimony of experts, and the amount that they would have agreed upon if they had been reasonably and voluntarily tried to reach an agreement. Right, That number 15 is sort of at the end of the day is what we're trying to get at here. What would have happened uh, if these two had uh, actually agreed to a 
uh, a uh, licensing uh, deal prior to infringement. So the TRIO process case um, is an interesting one. And, and so a few questions here, right? This is about furnaces. Um, uh, and, uh, and why does TRIO need to request reasonable royalties? Well, I mean, wouldn't they be better off to show lost profits? Well, they certainly, almost certainly would be. They have to request reasonable roy royalties, however, because TRIO only licenses the invention. TRIO does not actually manufacture the invention uh, and only licenses it to other manufacturers. So there's no lost profits on lost sales that can be shown. Right? Instead, the only thing that TRIO can show is that, that the licenses, uh, uh, that, it, that there is a royalty rate that would have been um, attributable to these sales that, that TRIO should receive. So how do you determine the reasonable royalty? Um, uh, and so the, uh, the issue is, uh, you know, how do you determine the reasonable royalty? Well, the Georgia Pacific factors, right? And these end up being essentially gather all the information you can uh, all through those factors, get as much evidence on the record as you can as the, as the patentee. Uh, the infringer obviously is going to counter with evidence of his or her own uh, describing how the reasonable royalty would be lower. And, and then um, you determine a, a royalty sale, right? So the, um, the TRIO case is an interesting one for uh, particular reasons, which is, so first of all, um, uh, TRIO sells furnaces uh, as part uh, as well. And, and so the license is part of the furnace sale. Shouldn't they get more than the $2,600 a year that the court awards because it almost certainly discounted the licenses uh, to, the, to this process? And so um, that's you know one question uh, for uh, what the reasonable royalty should be is you know what we know is what Trio typically sells uh, these licenses for to others. However, it's not clear that that number, which is what number they, this twenty six hundred dollars a year, which is the number the court awards, it's not clear that that is actually the number. That that Trio uh, would have agreed to uh, if Goldstein's sons had come to them and uh, requested a license, right? So uh, for that reason, it, the twenty six hundred dollars uh, per uh, might be uh, low because there might have been other reasons that Trio would have discounted the number, right? So the other thing that that the Trio case points out is. As a matter of policy, shouldn't we uh, say that the reasonable royalty should almost always be higher than what the infringer would have actually paid, right? I mean, if, if what Goldstein ends up paying here is $2,600, right, then that's the amount that apparently Goldstein could have paid if that company had simply um, uh, taken the license at the outset, right? Which, in some sense, is is correct in the sense that it's the the reasonable royalty. On the other hand, think about what incentive structure this creates, right? Doesn't this then create an incentive for potential infringers uh, to simply not take licenses and instead? Um, uh, Practice, practice the invention, the invention fringe, fringe, go through, go through litigation, litigation uh, because, uh, because of course you might win, you might win litigation, litigation, litigation for some, for some probability, probability on zero, on zero probability, probability that you would either, either not be infringing, be infringing uh, for, uh, some reason, for some reason or, or uh, the patent would be invalid, invalid or, or the, the, the patentee would simply not have not the resources, resources or the interest, or the interest in continuing to sue and for something lower and lower. If at the end of the day what the damages are is simply what you would have paid anyway, anyway, then uh, there's a pretty strong incentive to not take licenses, right? Uh, and so it might be that all that this case is not only somewhat unfair to TRIA, uh, but also um, uh, bad policy because it might create bad incentives, right? And you can see this. Um, uh, you know, the court has uh, said this before in various cases, including the Panduit case 
which is the setting of reasonable royalty after infringement cannot be treated as it was here as the equivalent of ordinary royalty negotiations among truly willing patent owners and licensees. That's a pretense that infringement never happened. It also make an election to infringe a handy means for competitors to impose a compulsory license policy upon every patent owner. Right. So this is the court uh, in Panduit saying we can't we can't just award. We have to award something more than merely what they would have agreed to pre-infringement because otherwise um, uh, there's no incentive to agree before infringement. Right. Um, uh, so this is. This is, you know, again, the way the court has described uh, the reasonable royalty rate. Determination of a reasonable royalty after infringement, like many devices in the law, rests on legal fiction. Created in an effort to compensate when profits are not provable, the reasonable royalty device conjures a willing licensor and licensee who, like ghosts of Christmas past, are dimly seen as negotiating a license. There is, of course, no actual willingness on either side and no license to do anything, as the infringer being normally enjoined is this... Stalin, this is the Panduit case, from further manufacture use or sale of the product. So this is the problem with the reasonable royalty analysis is that you are really engaging in, in a pure counterfactual, right? You can the, the goal of a reasonable ro royalty is to try and figure out what the parties would have agreed to, but of course the fact is the parties didn't agree. They did not manage to agree, and therefore that, that makes it hard. The result of this is that in many cases – Although this is also controversial, in many cases, um, the the courts have, uh, particularly the federal circuit, have seen fit to, you know, in a sense, heighten the amount of the reasonable royalty rate in order to deal with this problem of of bad incentives. Right? I mean, the 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 court is very concerned that if what the reasonable royalty damages award ends up being merely what you would have paid anyway. Uh, then there's going to be – it deeply undermines the incentive to take licenses beforehand and then causes all sorts of problems such as more litigation, uh, diminishes the protection of patents, and so forth. So if you instead add something of a kicker um, or increase the damages uh, uh, above what uh, sort of a wi willing negotiation would have been, uh, then uh, the idea is you're better off. Uh, from a policy perspective, even though as a practical matter that probably gives something of a windfall uh, to patentees in any particular case, right? So it would, you know, if we going back to the trio case, if if we had awarded instead of the twenty six hundred dollars, if the court said, well, what trio usually gets for these licenses is twenty six hundred dollars, um, but because this is after litigation, I'm gonna I'm gonna double that uh, to. Um, uh, you know, uh, fifty-two hundred dollars. Then, uh, you know, in some sense, that's a windfall for Trio, even though it probably sets the right incentives. And so that's the the basic policy debate here: is you know where where do we draw that line between trying to to encourage people to take licenses beforehand, not to litigate. Uh, versus not over awarding patent infringement because of course if we over award the, the patentees such as trio then they're not going to agree to licenses either right they're going to simply uh, uh, litigate with the hope of getting uh, the enhanced uh, uh, the increased amount of damages um, and so that makes this a, a tricky problem uh, and the courts have really never worked this out very well. There's lots of this language like what I uh, pointed out here in the Panduit where the court expresses concern about too low royalty rates um, but they don't really have a formula for how to fix that. What they usually do is offer some sort of, of kicker uh, for um, uh, the amount of royalty uh, found. So Lucent versus Gateway is another interesting case for a couple of reasons, right? Uh, one is uh, it, it showcases the difference between the lump sum royalty payments and a running royalty rate, right? The jury here awarded a lump sum royalty payment of $358 million. The infringement here was on a date picker uh, for some uh, Microsoft products, uh, and uh, the, the jury awarded $358 million, Right. So how is this different? I mean, why? Well, the answer is we, we don't know why. This is one of the, the interesting things about jury trials is you actually don't know, even if you have a, a fairly carefully crafted jury form, you actually don't know exactly why uh, the jury might have done, done uh, this, but they did. 
Um, how is this different than a running royalty rate? Well, uh, it's a lump sum payment, right? That means that that um, uh, the idea here is that that there would have been one payment, and then the patent would have been um, uh, it would have been fully paid up, and that therefore there was no no more payments, right? Um, what the court is, is saying here is that in order to show lump sum payments, um, you have to show uh, the information uh, that would, the evidence that would underlie the calculation of such payments, right? And so uh, necessarily, uh, if you're going to have a lump sum royalty payment, the parties must have had in mind some quantity um, of sales that was likely to occur and so therefore um, there needs to be evidence about what the parties thought was the, uh, the likely quantity of sales. Similarly, there has to be some uh, evidence of, uh, of what the parties thought about sort of the term of the license and other aspects of a lump sum uh, payment. And here the court says there's simply no evidence on the record for how the jury actually calculated this other than pure guesswork and speculation. Right? And in fact, the court seems to think that this was very high because the award was about 8% of the total revenues uh, for the products, which the court says seems extremely high given um, uh, that this was a fairly minor feature, simply a date picker application inside a much larger program. So um, uh, the court says that there's nowhere near enough evidence to support the jury's determination uh, for the $358 million lump sum payment. Um, there were other royalty payments, uh, lump sum royalty payments and evidence. A lot of them were not particularly similar. Some of them were similar, but the ones that were most similar were significantly lower. Um, and so basically the court says, uh, send this case back. Um, uh, we think the payment, sh if it's lump sum, should be substantially lower, and indeed there needs to be actual evidence presented uh, for how um, uh, a lump sum payment might be calculated. The other issue in Lucent versus Gateway is, is this entire market value rule, right, where the court says here where there's a minor um, feature, right, they describe this date picker application as a, as a fairly minor feature, um, uh, then you can't base your royalty upon the entire market value of the products. Now what value of the products you're supposed to use is of course tricky as I talked about earlier with respect to the entire market value rule. Um, if you're not going to use the entire value of the product sale, um, you know how do you do that? Do you say well as a date picker in a um, in a word processing program or a, uh, a date book program uh, worth 10% uh, of the total um, uh, market value? Is it worth 5%? Is it worth 25%? I mean, again, I think you know the answer is you would get a bunch of experts to come in and opine upon exactly how that works uh, and what the what attribution should be made. But here, this is a an important limitation on the entire market value rule uh, shown in the Lucent case because the court is very skeptical and indeed reverses um, any analysis of damages in this case based on the entire market value of the software products at issue and instead says you need to um, uh, more carefully attribute the, uh, the value associated with the particular patented invention. Um, so that's the Lucent versus Gateway case. So let's finish up here with a, a brief uh, discussion of, of willful infringement and attorney's fees. So first attorney's fees and court's costs. So the general uh, American rule is that each side pays their own costs. Uh, many other countries in the world, of course, have a loser pays rule. Uh, but in the U.S., we generally think that win or lose, you pay your own costs. Um, in what are called exceptional cases, the loser may be required to pay some fees and costs. Uh, these can occur in two cases in the patent context, usually uh, willful infringement or what is known as vexatious litigation, uh, perhaps ba basically bad behavior during the litigation process, right? Making uh, repeated uh, and unwarranted discovery requests, uh, uh, n uh, not being timely repeatedly, things like that um, that, that can often uh, cause judges to award fees and costs. Um, uh, the enhanced damages, however, are um, established in 284.
The court may increase damages up to three times the amount found or assessed, right? So up to treble damages. And when willful infringement is found, courts will almost always grant the, the treble damages, right? So willful infringement uh, has two prongs, right? One is some notice that you're infringing, some actual notice that you are um, uh, likely to infringe. And, and second, then a uh, failure to exercise a level of due care uh, for uh, uh, whether or not you infringe. And how can you show your due care? Right? Well, the most important way to show your due care uh, is to um, uh, get an opinion from an attorney, um, uh, from a patent attorney who analyzes your product, for example, and the, and the relevant patent that you have now become aware of and uh, offers an opinion as to the infringement or lack thereof of your product. And so that's, that's the most important way to show uh, your due care. Um, now, this has generated, uh, as we noted earlier in the course, uh, in a sense a cottage industry of um, opinion letters from patent attorneys uh, uh, offering opinions as, as to whether or not there's infringement. Um, and, and so uh, the... Uh, the, the standard case here, the, the one I had you read uh, first, was the Norbrems versus Dana, the Fed Circuit 2004. And uh, the, the traditional rule for will, willfulness is that the patentee, in order to avoid, or sorry, the infringer, in order to avoid willfulness, has to exercise due care to determine whether or not she is infringing. Uh, seeking evidence of counsel uh, is considered to be evidence of due care. Uh, the Fromson case, uh, an older Federal Circuit case, uh, says that courts can infer that no opinion was obtained or no, no or that if obtained, the opinion was negative if you don't offer a, uh, a letter in evidence. Um, so what that means as a practical matter is that under the, the Fromson standard, the Norbrems standard, uh, the uh, or no the pre Norbrems standard uh, the court would say that that if in the consideration of willfulness uh, which is a fact question to go for, uh, in front of the jury if the patentee or sorry if the infringer cannot offer evidence that they sought uh, and obtained a attorney opinion uh, showing uh, explaining that they did not infringe then the jury is entitled and it's, it could be instructed to infer that either the, pat, the infringer did not seek such an opinion and therefore may have failed to exercise due care or that if they sought such an opinion that that opinion came back as negative meaning they infringe and again that would be uh, evidence of a lack of due care so what that meant is that it was uh, if you is that unless you are able to present as part of your um, case as the potential defendant in a patent infringement lawsuit a uh, a letter uh, from an attorney analyzing the issues and saying that you didn't infringe you are potentially almost certainly going to be on the hook for willful infringement right. Uh, and what that meant is that, you know, the, it again, as I noted earlier, created sort of this cottage industry of willful infringement letter of infringement analysis letters. There was a lot of suspect about whether or not these letters were sort of in good faith. Um, uh, there was a fair amount of litigation where courts would analyze the letters and try and figure out whether or not these letters were um, sufficiently analytical to provide um, the cover that was needed. And a lot of money rested on these opinion letters because uh, you know they were basically the difference between treble damages and no treble damages if you ended up infringing a patent. Right, uh, and so the court thought that this was a problem, and in Norbrems, the court strips away the inferences uh, supporting uh, willful infringement. Right, <laughs> what this means is that there are no inferences; that you can't instruct the jury, you can't draw inferences either way. Right, if you say that any any communications uh, uh, with your lawyer uh, respecting whether or not you infringe is attorney-client privileged. Uh, then you can't then uh, 
uh, infer um, either that there was no uh, opinion letter sought or that if it was sought that it was negative. There's just no inference and no adverse inference. If you just say, no, I didn't seek an opinion, that is not intended to, that it cannot be an adverse inference um, uh, with respect to your exercising of due care. Right? And then, so the, uh, and then the court follows that up three years later in the Seagate case, right, which raises the bar for uh, uh, willfulness. Instead of a requirement that you affirmatively, as the potential infringer, affirmatively exercise due care, instead now in order to find willfulness, the patentee has to show that the infringer acted with reckless disregard for the consequences. Right? So this raises the bar very significantly. Right? What the court says they mean by uh, reckless is that, it, that there's acting in, in the face of an unjustifiably high risk. Right? Therefore, willful infringement now in the post-Seagate world says that the infringer acted is, is, is according to the following standard. The infringer acted despite an objectively high likelihood that its actions constituted infringement of a valid patent. That's a much higher standard than the pre nor Brems case, right, where the, uh, where the infringer was required to exercise due care to determine whether or not she is infringing, right? Note the difference between the pre nor Brems Fromson standard and uh, the Seagate standard, which is now um, uh, the, uh, the infringer, in order to be found to be willfully infringing, acted despite uh, an objectively high likelihood that its actions constitute infringement of a valid patent. Okay, so that is um, uh, the post-Seagate willful infringement issues are um, that the state of mind of the infringer is not relevant. Right? It used to be that you had to think about due care. Were they being careful? Were they trying to avoid infringement? Here, it, what matters is uh, objective high likelihood uh, that its actions constitute infringement. Right? It must show the infringer knew or should have known of the high risk of infringement. That raises the standard for willful infringement. It doesn't eliminate it entirely, but it definitely reduces quite dramatically the incidence of willful infringement in, in patent litigation um, uh, that would have occurred. And you combine that together with the Nor Brems uh, issue of stripping away any inferences related to uh, opinion of counsel, and, and now you're getting to the point where willfulness is becoming pretty rare, uh, whereas in the, in the you know, pre-2000s, uh, it was actually fairly common in uh, the patent litigation context to find willfulness. Cool.